everyone. My name is Moshe Emmerman, and I'm the founder at Flank Source. At Flank Source, we're building an internal developer, developer platform for GitOps fans. I've been a, a GitOps fan, I think, before GitOps even became a thing. I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in the Open GitOps Working Group, helping trying to define the principles of GitOps. Uh, before that, spent quite a lot of time in the Kubernetes community, especially in the Cluster API uh, group. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about our journey at Flang Source building a GitOps enabled SAS control plane. Let's get started. So when we when we're looking at building a SAS control plane or, or building a SAS product, we the first decision that we needed to take was was what type of architecture did we want to build it using? And there are really two different types of, of architectures. So a shared nothing and a dedicated a model. So the dedicated is often a, a hybrid model where you have some dedicated infrastructure, some shared infrastructure. And the characteristics of a shared nothing um, architecture being that everything is shared, costs are quite low, um, but your customizability and flexibility is quite limited. And on a, a dedicated SaaS uh, architecture where you actually provision new infrastructure for every tenant, uh, the costs are quite high, but you can achieve high levels of isolation and you can um, provision services that have a, a lot wider range of offerings than, than you can if you're doing a purely shared infrastructure. Uh, mission control is really a lot of, uh, has a lot of orchestration capability and a lot of scripting. And this really made an easy decision for us to use a dedicated SaaS architecture. So we're gonna look at how, how we went about building that. Before we do that, we want to uh, have a quick recap on, on what GitOps is and what it really means from a control plane perspective. So first and foremost, GitOps being declarative, and this is the, the foundation on which everything GitOps is built on. So rather than applying operations to your control plane, whether it's by event management UI or click ops or CLI ops, uh, everything that, you, that you're doing on that control plane and on, on tenant infrastructure should be declared upfront. And once it's declared, that declaration should really be versioned and immutable. Uh, Git is the most common way of doing this, but you can use a database. There are some challenges that I'll, I'll get into when using a database for, for a Git store. Certainly possible. And the third attribute being that all, all changes must be done, pulled automatically, and this is where tools like PluxCV and Argo come in, uh, and these will also reconcile continuously. So uh, provisioning the infrastructure once and then forgetting it isn't good enough. You really need to continuously check that infrastructure to make sure that if there's any drift, if there are any changes in the state store that maybe your triggers missed, then it is reconciled eventually, and you get an eventually consistent system that doesn't have any snowflakes in it. So what is a control plane and, and what are the capabilities that we're looking for from a control plane? Uh, first and foremost, provision. So you want to be able to provision infrastructure in an automated way. Uh, this provisioning is tends to be a very long life cycle. So you could provision some infrastructure upfront, but ultimately you're going to need to upgrade that the software versions, perhaps you're going to do upgrades on the underlying infrastructure, maybe migration between workloads and clusters. So this provisioning is a life cycle rather than a once-off event. Cost is a, is a really big factor. So especially if you have trial users and um, you need to provision infrastructure, it, it can be a challenge to maintain that cost and keep the cost low. Uh, resource placement, capacity planning, billing, all come into how you manage costs on your tenant infrastructure. With all with all customer data, you, you need high levels, levels of security. And if you're provisioning the infrastructure, you probably want to reduce the amount of lateral movement that attackers could do if they do breach a single tenant. So you want to isolate your tenants and make sure that, that they, they don't allow lateral movement. And, and finally, probably doing SOC or uh, ISO compliance certifications, which 
give you a long list of, of things and evidence and processes that you need to keep and follow. So what is what is a non-GitOps control plan look like and what are some of the challenges here? So we'll start with a, a, a typical operation using Clerk. Clerk is a as a user authentication and tenant tenant management system. It's a, a SaaS. I'm not associated with them, but but we do use them at, at Clunk Source. So we have a request that comes in, um, and that will hit a database and normally get stored in the database. It might go into an event queue for an event sourcing system, but more than likely it's going to hit some database of sorts. From that database. We'll have your provisioning service or infrastructure go and create the resources for you. This could be a combination of Ansible, Terraform, CloudFormation. You might have some scripts in there. You might have a home-baked framework for this. Once that initial provisioning is done, you're normally going to need a management UI on top of this. And this management UI uh, will probably speak to your provisioning service, maybe some other services to get the state of infrastructure and tenants so that day two operations can be performed. And then you're going to come to an audit and your auditor is going to ask you a long list of questions around your database. And those questions are quite aligned with this version and immutable state um, of, of your declaration. So you could make a database into a GitOps compliant data store, but it requires you to implement change tracking, uh, write worm audit trails to apply row level ACLs, um, to really have a very mature database footprint in, which is non-trivial to implement. Um, and even then, once you've, you've got a very mature and secure database implementation for, for your data, then you'll ultimately get these big customers or incidents where you need to make a, a minor tweak to something and there's no obvious way to do that unless you've built it into the management UI. There are no escape patches. Um, so when we look at building a, a SaaS control plane that's GitOps enabled, what we're really trying to do is, is build isolated control loops and control loops are the thing that makes Q Kubernetes so wonderful and amazing. Um, and I'll, I'll show you now what that means. So given a, a Kubernetes deployment, um, you'll have a controller that looks at that deployment um, and goes out and creates a replica set. This, this operation is one isolated control loop. The replica set isn't necessarily aware of, of the deployment. The replica set controller doesn't depend on the deployment controller and vice versa. They operate in isolation of one another. If the deployment controller is down, you can manually go and create replica sets yourself and the replica set controller will function just fine. And you have this chain of isolated control loops that work across the board. So you have the replica set, which is another control loop that goes in and hands off a pod to a scheduler and scheduler will hand off the pod to a kubelet and then we'll have CSI controllers that provision resources and volumes. Um, and this is what makes Kubernetes great. We want to do, achieve the same level of isolation, but at a one level higher abstraction. So we want to apply control loops on tenants across multiple regions, multiple clouds, multiple clusters. Our stack that we are using for this is fairly straightforward. So we're using Clerk for authentication and tenant management, GitHub for a GitOps code repository. So there are a couple of settings that you, you do need to still apply in a GitHub repo around enforcing um, uh, no deletion of history, archiving it, applying approval rules, um, ensuring that branches are protected. So there are a number of things that you still need to do to make a GitOps repository, a GitOps code repository, but those are fairly straightforward and to, to implement. We use Flux as a GitOps controller that continuously reconciles. 
um, packages our application. Uh, we, our application is uh, essentially a, a number of pods that run connected to a shared SQL Server database, which is outside of the stack. We use the cluster, which is a, a tool for isolating tenants. Mission Control does a lot of work with Kubernetes APIs. It has a lot of CRDs that are used. Um, it's so we, we we made the decision to deploy every tenant into a V cluster, and they they get control over that that Kubernetes API. And finally, we do store and uh, generate and store secrets using SOPs and key vaults. Uh, this lets us uh, have a re, um, restorability of of environments and high levels of security. How this works, so again, we start with clerk that comes in, uh, makes a call or a webhook, initiates a call to our tenant controller. This is a Go project that uses the Go Git library for interfacing with Git repositories. First thing it does is generate the, the manifest that make up a tenant. In our case, this is a namespace and a Helm release. We also generate a database password and encrypt that using SOPs. Uh, together, these then go up to Git as a PR. You could also do a uh, push directly to a branch. A PR gives you a little bit more control in terms of the cross-cutting governance that you can apply. So you can, for example, uh, apply rules that deletions are only uh, implemented after a, a pair of human eyes looks at it or you could implement fraud detection pipelines that will stop a deployment if if fraud is detected, building pipelines, that type of thing. So it, it gives you all of those great features that we're missing out of the non-GitOps control plane. You get that for free with a GitOps repository. This, this interaction then produces a single isolated control loop, nice and easy to think about and manage. And from here, Flux picks up these uh, manifests that are stored in the Git repo, decrypts any resources that, that it needs to. To note here, the tenant controller and the Flux controller, or the workloads in general, uh, are physically isolated. So the tenant controller being privileged in terms of being able to manage resources, databases, passwords, that type of thing and, and the workloads only being able to consume things. The flux, uh, flux goes out and, and creates a new namespace and inside that uh, provisions an initial chart. This chart generates a new or deploys a new vCluster. vCluster is essentially just K3S running inside of a pod and it then substitutes the API server that new pods run under to this new vCluster API server. Um, it's you know, important to note here that these workload clusters we run with very limited privileges, so they don't have uh, access to other namespaces, they don't have access to uh, elevated IAM service accounts, so it's, it's quite limited in what they can do. What happens is some of the secrets come in, these get injected into the vCluster. Uh, the Helm chart deploys into the vCluster that will create a pod. That pod doesn't deploy inside the vCluster, it actually mirrors out to the parent cluster um, and ingress and networking then happen at the parent cluster level with the state being reflected to the vCluster. You don't necessarily need to use vCluster. You could use a standalone Helm chart and just deploy pods. It really depends on the level of, of isolation between tenants that you're looking for. If you're not running a pod-based architecture or you're running a hybrid uh, architecture where you have some pod-based resources and some cloud-based resources, then there are a number of GitOps infrastructure controllers that you can use. Crossplane that we use AWS controllers for Kubernetes or ACK and the GKE config connector are all good options for deploying cloud resources. 
I don't re recommend deploying these resources from within that tenant cluster uh, from a, a security and a privilege escalation perspective. I prefer to keep that physically isolated. So we would, what would happen is we then have a, there's a separate Flux instance that runs in a, in a privileged cluster. This privileged uh, cluster then goes and creates resources from that same Helm chart, maybe a different Helm chart um, with the cloud resources. Cross, Crossplane picks up those resources and then provisions the, the access in our case, we're giving access to a database. Um, and then goes and assigns those AM service accounts to those pods that are running in the workload cluster. You can do escape patches as well, fairly easy here. So let's say you have an accountant and the accountant wants to mark a tenant as uh, billing is overdue and, and as a result, pause the infrastructure, um, uh, have the infrastructure display warnings to the user, decommission infrastructure, they can then go in and push changes directly to that Git repo, either as an individual making commits, or you could have a system making these commits as well via a tenant controller or a different controller. So you get a nice isolated controlling peer again. Um, and, and as a result, you have lots of little isolated control loops that work independently of another uh, it's easy to think about, easy to troubleshoot. So what are the benefits that we get out of this? So everything is auditable uh, by default. The escape patches are easy to implement. So whatever the tenant controller does, you can do yourself either manual or by API. We get that nice baked in rollback and recovery from Git uh, commits and tagging. Uh, the complexity is reduced significantly. So whereas um, a non GitOps control plane is highly coupled with that database and with the triggering of, of actions between them in a GitOps based control plane, you have handoffs between systems that are not independent of one another and, and not even physically connected. And then you have a very low total cost of ownership. So uh, implementing this type of control plane there's a lot of existing tools. We we built a tenant controller. It's probably, I think, less than a thousand lines of code. So it, it's not a very difficult thing to do. Um, and there's quite a lot of tools around this area. Those existing tools have a lot of mind share in the market. Troubleshooting them in isolation is very easy. And as a result, you have a system that, that is resilient, reliable, and cost-effective. Here are some links to some of the, the projects that we're using. So the Flank Source Tenant Controller is a little bit customized to our application use case, but you could take that and um, clone it and, and use it for your own purposes. Flux CD, um, AWS Controllers for Creates is another GitOps um, connector and vCluster that we use for tenant isolation. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed.